This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. You've seen their teardowns all over the internet, the free repair guide for everything, and the ultimate marketplace for electronic tools and parts. For $5 off your purchase of $10 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. On this 300th episode of Know How, this is Know How. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Balliser. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to be uh, pushing the knowledge into your know hole. That's right. On this, uh, we didn't do anything special for 300, we, did we? we? Did. I mean, we saw it on the calendar, like, eh, maybe you should do something special. But, you know, 300 is just, it's it's just a pit stop on the way to 400 and 500 and 1,000. Oh, yeah, we're totally going to do 1,000. We're so getting there. Our knowledge will blot out the sun, <laughs> right? As people in the chat room are saying, oh, 300 episodes, so how long till I know everything? <laughs> I think that's like 5, 5, 12. Right? At five least, 12, yeah. at least. And then we'll just start cycling back through again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll just start from the beginning. No, but folks, this is the 300th episode of Know How, which is amazing when you consider the fact that I first came into the show like episode 62, you came in in episode 84. Right. So it's been a long time since we've been running the show. Right, and... Partially why we didn't plan anything special for this is we didn't think we'd be doing it this long. Yeah, yeah, we... we <laughs> I figured we'd get to, like, 299, and then Leo like, and Lisa done. would be, like, done. <laughs> you know what? You've had a good run, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, okay. Exactly. No, but, but we're still here. We're still bringing you knowledge. And, in fact, we are doing the last bit of Arduino 102. You may remember mm -hmm. last year we did Arduino 101 where we went over things like switches, simple digital input and yeah. output, and, and now how to, to use something like an RTC this right. How series. PWM works. Precisely. Yeah. But now we've been doing things like, okay, let's hook up to an I squared C screen. Yeah. Let's use a real-time clock at the same time. Mm -hmm. Let's use the internal memory of an Arduino. Yeah. Today we're going to be doing something that people have been asking for the longest time, and that is how do you take your Arduino and put it onto a network? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I've been looking forward to that. Um, I I liked what we did with the OEL uh, LED screen, and then I'm looking, and we've got the giant just yeah, yeah, liquid we... crystal display mm, for this project. It's kind of it's kind of toasty. Oh, people have been wanting this for the longest time because although it's nice to run an embedded project on Arduino, you know, something yeah. like lights, mm -hmm. it would add a little extra something something if I had the ability to to control it or at least monitor it. Remotely, I can think of one instance in which I really wish I had remote monitoring set up. Like, for example, when Why my Arduino decided to start feeding my plants pure fertilizer. <laughs> that, that would <laughs> what, have been What a good... would be bad about that? <laughs> except all your plants dying. Dying, dying. Mm. Di not just dying, but remember, once when the plants die, they stop soaking up all the water, uh -huh. which means the water starts <laughs> overflowing, which means your superior comes down and yells at you huh. for all the brownish water coming down through the floor. Yeah, why is it uh, flooding up there? And, and so... Partially why you're talking about that too is isn't a lot of these projects that we're doing leading up to the eventual Growduino Correct. automation project that you've been doing? Exactly. And what I want there is I want the capability to receive a notification when any event happens. So right. the lights turn on, the lights turn off, it starts watering, it starts fertilizing, it stops watering, it yeah. stops fertilizing, temperature, humidity. I mean, all of that, I want that logic in the Arduino. So right. it should be able to deal with it on its own. However, I still want to be able to monitor it remotely, either on an app or on or my laptop. Or a separate Arduino. Or a separate Arduino. Yeah. Something that allows me to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be and doing. And then you can start building in redundancies to say, hey, like, if I get this emergency code, shut down. Please Precisely. stop watering everything. Like, if my Arduino just sends, oh, by the way, I'm going to give your plants uh, twice as much fertilizer as they should need, I should be able to override remotely and say, you know what, no, let's not do that. Nah. Let's, let's stop that. <laughs> Yeah. So that's what we're going to be doing, which means we need to up our game because obviously an Arduino doesn't have a network interface. There's no Bluetooth, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no Ethernet built into the, a standard Nano or an Uno, which mm -hmm. is what we've been using. In fact, we could even go one step up to something like the Mega, which is just a larger Arduino. It's got more memory, it's got more processing power, it's got more inputs and outputs. This also doesn't have a, any sort of uh, network interface, no. which is why we need something a little bit like 
this. A breakout board. Yeah, so this is a shield if you uh, go to the overhead here. This just allows me to plug straight into the pins on either an Arduino Uno or an Arduino Mega mm -hmm. and give it standard Ethernet. So I get uh, uh, Ethernet networking capabilities. So you need all that just for Ethernet? Well, kind of a big shield. Kind well, that's just the size. I mean, look, this is also a networking shield. This one's for. Uh -huh. The, the Nano. So this does the same thing, because remember, the, the Uno and the Nano are essentially the same. The only difference is, uh, you know, the board size and the format. So this is a Nano that's oh. actually on top of the network interface board. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's nice and small. That makes sense. Uh, one thing, though, mm -hmm. this works. This yeah. is fine. However, you're really limited by the amount of power that you have, and you're limited by the space. So although this is a this is a fun form factor to play with, yeah. I would not develop on it. It's it's a pain in the butt to develop on. But once you have your prototype finished and you've kind of moved along, you could do the smaller one, right? Precisely, yeah. exactly. So what I'm going to do is I've got my standard uh, Arduino Uno here. Mm -hmm. These pins just match up perfectly. So I just put it from the bottom over down. So this is now. Oh network ready. It's not automatic. When I turn it on, it's not like I have networking capabilities. Right. I still have to create Configure. software that will uh, allow it to use the shield. But you'll see I have pass-throughs, right. so I can still access all my digital pins. That's nice. It's actually connected to the uh, Uno via this, which is a, a different bus. It's a, it's a management bus. Hmm. Um, additionally, I get access SD to card. this. I have a little SD card. Remember yeah. in the last episode, we showed people how to use the onboard EEPROM mm -hmm. in order to store values that would not go away when I restarted. Right. So now can we use a, basically a mass flash storage? Absolutely. So I can put, I think this one will take up to 64 gigabyte uh, of memory, which I I don't know what I would do with that other than uh, using a, say, like a place to store log files. I was going to say maybe video files or something. Uh, I'm not going to run a video. Yeah, through an Arduino. yeah I don't know. It's, it's not going to work so well. But uh, we're going to do some very simple, some basic commands, some mm -hmm. basic demonstrations on how to use this so that you can build it into a project that you might already have. Very cool. I mean, imagine any time you've got the Arduino doing something, Mm -hmm. Once you have this lesson down, you should be able to network enable it so you can make it do that something remotely. Which is really nice, especially if you don't have like access to it directly. Like you want to put it right. outside or something and not have to walk back and forth, forth from your greenhouse to your house or something like that. Or for example, I have created one of these using Cayenne, which is something we were going to cover, but then we Cayenne had all the pepper? Persec stuff. It's, it's a, a My Devices that allows me to make an Internet of Things device very simply, very easily. Oh, okay. And I created two that are connected to the uh, the dun light on um, my uh, the washer dryer in our house. Uh huh. So when that light turns on, it flips a relay yeah. that tells the Arduino that the dun light has turned on, mm -hmm. and then it uh, texts the person whose laundry was in the machine. <laughs> super like simple, yeah. super super stupid, but it's like, yeah, okay, why not do that? That's, right? That's no, that's cool. smart. I like that idea. But in order for that to work. I need network capability. I can't okay. use Cayenne unless I have a way onto the network. Yeah. There are Wi-Fi shields. However, I don't like using Wi-Fi for IoT. I'm not a big fan of that because Wi-Fi is temperamental sometimes, especially on a device as low power as like a Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. or an Arduino. Uh, for that, I really prefer something that's wired. That's one less thing that can go wrong. Yeah. And if I'm doing something like monitoring my garden, I don't want a flaky Wi-Fi AP to be the reason why suddenly it's dead. Right. I mean, not to make light of it, but it is kind of a life or death situation when it comes, at least for your plants, as far as getting watered and fertilized. So probably should make it as redundant as possible and, and uh, foolproof. Yes, indeed. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into this. First of all, we're going to do a little bit of wiring because this first example, we're going to pull almost directly from the example library on the Arduino sketch. It's, it's actually one of the ones that are provided when you install Arduino. Cool. Uh, we need to power up these two potentiometers. I've seen those before. Yeah, this is, this is like one of the very first 3D printed boards that we made. This is just a holder for the Raspberry Pi and a little teeny tiny breadboard. Yeah. So we're going to pull 5 volts and ground. There's my ground pin right there, like so. And I'm going to pull 5 volts right there. Like so. And then I'm going to go into either side of this potentiometer. Because remember, the way that a potentiometer works is I need ground and 5 volts on the outside. There's three pins. So the outside pins get ground and 5 volts. The inside pin, that's the wiper, that will change as, uh, as I rotate the potentiometer. Mm -hmm. That goes into my analog inputs. That makes inputs. sense, yeah. Right. So now I'm going to go from ground here 
to ground here. So I'm just daisy chaining these. You're a madman. And five volt here to five volt there. Boom. Boom. Now I need to take the center pin. Right. Which and is that's going to go into analog one. And the center pin here is going to go into analog zero. And now the Raspberry Pi will know what inputs to take from. Well, well I'm going to tell it. Or so no, I'm, I'm going to be telling it to know. take, the yeah, Arduino is going to be taking inputs from our, uh, A0 and A1, analog mm -hmm. zero and analog one. And as I rotate each of these potentiometers, those two values will increase and decrease. Right. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at the code that's going to allow me to do this. Let's go ahead and give power to my little... Unlimited uh, do power. Do we know here? And I'm going to give it network connectivity since we now have that option, which is so happy. How about that? All right, so let's start this up. Now, here is the code that I'm going to be using for this one. Alex, if you go ahead and come over to this computer. Uh, again, this is the Ethernet sketch. It's slightly changed. But if you go into File, Examples, Ethernet, down below here. Ooh, come on, there we go. You keep going. Uh, uh, where's the Ethernet? I, uh, yeah, Ethernet. This is actually just called the web server. So this is the web server example. Here's what it's going to do. It's super, super simple. You're going you're gonna to wonder why there's such a hullabaloo about it. I've, I'm including two libraries, SPI and Ethernet. And this is just the way for me. SPI is how it's communicating with that shield oh, okay. over the SPI bus. And Ethernet's pretty Ethernet is, yeah, That's the library to, to do all the things that need for Ethernet. This right here. This is kind of cool for, for networking, for the people who really liked our Networking 101 series. Remember how we talked about the MAC address? Mm -hmm. The media access control, it's the physical, physical address. Physical address, yeah. Like your, your Mr. Robot. <laughs> That's exactly how I think of it now. <laughs> but this is the hexadecimal combination that sets the physical address. In Arduino, I can actually set it for anything I want. On the side of, uh, of my board, there's actually a address that they gave me yeah. that I should use. But you, you I don't have say, to use that. But we also explain the dangers of doing that because there right. are certain devices that fall into a certain bracket of MAC addresses. Yeah. And if both those devices have the same MAC address, you'll run into conflict. And especially since here, um, since I could just load this particular code on 100 different Arduinos, if I plug all those 100 different Arduinos into my network, they all have the same physical address. Right. That's going to be a problem. The router <laughs> no, will just freak out. You'll be all. like, whoa, yeah. where, what? Yeah, you think you're being super s sneaky by using the same MAC address for yeah. like all of them? Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you go back to my, my window here, so this needs to be unique. In this particular case, I'm using D-E-A-D-B-E-E-F-F-E-E-D. -E 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 uh, and if I change it at all, yeah. any of those entries, the router will think it's a different device. Okay. Okay. So just just be aware of that. Now this is this is kind of cool. IP address IP one nine two one six eight zero dot two two nine. I can specify it. So I I've actually already set the address that this device is going to be at. It's going to be right. at one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot zero dot two two nine. What we will show in the next example is that you don't have to do it this way. You can actually have your Arduino get a DHCP address, so it can automatically get an address from the router. Okay. In this particular case. Because this is a super simple example, I'm setting a, uh, this is a static address, 192.168.0.229. Well, you're going to want a static address if you're going to remote access it, right? Well, yeah, uh, but well, yeah, there's, there's, there's ways around that. Yeah. Okay. All right, so Ethernet server, this starts up the Ethernet, or actually, it, it sets the Ethernet server to listen to port 80. Remember in Networking 101, we talked mm -hmm. about ports? Ports are just the device listening on a specific port for a request for service. Right. So this is telling it to start an Ethernet server and listen on port 80, which is HTTP. So it's a standard HTTP server. Makes sense. OK. Uh, on my setup, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm, uh, I'm opening up the serial uh, port, and I'm uh, basically saying, OK, go ahead and, and wait to send stuff to the serial port. Because this has no screen, the only way I'm going to get data on this is by opening up a serial port. OK. Uh, this, this is all specific to our, uh, our networking thing. Ethernet begin. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's calling the library, it's saying, okay, go ahead and turn yourself on with the MAC address I specified above, with the IP address I specified above. Right. In the next example, I'm not going to specify an IP and it's just going to get a DHCP address. Hmm. But I do need a MAC. I need to give it a MAC because it has to be able to identify me on the network. Okay. Then it's going to turn on the server. So the server will start listening at port 80. And then print out servers at... Right, because I need to know where that server is. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open up my serial monitor. Oh, uh, I'm going to set it for the right port first. 
and uh, I actually have to upload this code. So <laughs> let's, let's do that. I'm going to start uploading the code. And as it's uploading, I'm going to go ahead and explain the rest of it. This is just doing one thing. See, in the loop, that's just one clump of code. All this is going to do is it's going to sit there. The Ethernet server is going to sit until it right and hears a client. So it's mm. going to listen. Once it hears a client, then it's going to go ahead and start running through these instructions. All these instructions are going to do is write to the Ethernet port what a standard HTML file looks like. So okay. this is the header. So HTTP 1.1, 200, OK, all the way up to the start of HTML. And down here, we have the end of HTML. So everything that's in this area, this is my web page. Okay, and all my web page is going to do is it's going to look at the analog channel, so the two analog uh, inputs that I have, 0 and 1, because it does it until it's, great, it's, uh, until it's uh, no longer less than 2. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's going to print the value from that channel. Oh, OK. OK, so let's, but in order for this to work, I'm going to need to know what is the serial address. Now, I mean, what is the Ethernet address? Uh, right. Sorry, the IP address. The, the IP, IP address, address is 192.168.0.229, <laughs> which is exactly what it was supposed to be, because I right, said that you in static. Right, you said it as that, yeah. Okay, but now, let's go ahead and go into a web page. Mm -hmm. And then type in the local 192. address. 192.168.0.229, was it 229? Yeah, 229. Uh, 229, yeah. Okay, so when you I do this, you can't type in the physical address, right? The MAC address and get to it through the address bar? Um, you could. But that'd be a pain. The, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's a, one thing that you, oh, there we go. You have to remember is uh, Arduinos are kind of slow, so it, it can take a while for the service to start up. It can, actually, the longest it's ever taken for the service to start up for me was about three minutes. Oh, just, wow. just know that. But okay. now it's running. In the background, this is actually what the server is doing. So the server keeps connecting serving out the page, disconnecting. Connecting, serving out the page, disconnecting. That's what's happening. And what, what I've hmm. set it to do is to refresh every five seconds or so. Why is that? Uh, just That's just what I did. Just I just, to, oh, yeah. okay, to demonstrate. Yeah. But see, now if uh, you see analog input zero, uh, one is zero, and, and uh, I, I should be able to change this. Actually, I think I plugged it into the wrong ports. Hey, that was kind of silly. Like, so. Oh, I actually, <laughs> that's my bad. There we go. The ground and power yeah, were? ground was in the wrong slot. Ah, I see. OK, there we go. Now if you go to the, back to that page, uh, ooh, you're going to have to zoom in on that. What we Enhance. Zoom? There we go. Ah. So if I change, as I turn the wipers, every time it refreshes, you're going to see those values are going to start changing. See? Oh, OK. OK, cool. OK. But let's, uh, let's uh, because it's standard HTML, people should know this. Let's, let's jump back over here, Alex. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do is I, I don't like those, uh, those things being so small. So I'm going to add something right about here under the HTML. And I'm going to say font size plus 6. That's going to make much larger text. <laughs> uh, and uh, the other thing I wanted to change was uh, the refresh. So right now it's refreshing every five seconds, right here. This is this is just standard HTML. Make it Fiesta. Yeah. So it's 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 saying okay, every five seconds go ahead and, and ask the server for another connection. Right. I'm going to change that to one. Let's go ahead and upload that. So what it should do is I've just changed the code. So now when it refreshes the page first. Yeah. It's going to change the refresh rate to once one. every second. Every and second, it's going to try. Bigger font. And a much bigger font. So Is there a danger of refreshing too fast? Yes. <laughs> yes, very much so. Because, yeah. again, an Arduino is a very low power device. Yeah. doesn't have a lot of horsepower. If, if you start requesting too much, it will just start lagging. It would just, mm. I mean, it won't break it. No. But you're going to start timing out. But the equivalent of little tears coming out of the Arduino, yeah. like, why would you do that to yeah. me? Uh, let me make it clear. This is not a web server like that you might consider. <laughs> Don't put this on the yeah. internet to serve out your web page. That no, would be no, a no. really, really bad idea. This is just a way for you to connect to your Arduino right. and, and, uh, and get, get some data back. Yeah. Right. Uh, people will call this an internet of thing, a thing, <laughs> yeah. but don't think of it as an Internet of Things device that you would actually plug into the Internet. I see. Uh, I see. With a public address. That would be a really <laughs> bad idea. Oh. Super. super. Can, I, can have I expressed how bad that is how yet? Bad? Um, no. Tell me more. Tell me why it would be so bad. Because <laughs> <laughs> the little tears will come okay, out of Okay, so obviously my f I, I, mess up. I, I forgot to put equals, font equal. But, oh, so the font Padre. didn't change, but 
notice how it's refreshing much faster. So now it's refreshing yes. every second. So as I turn turn these wipers, ooh, this is not super exciting because these are just values that are changing. No, but that then means that we can incorporate those into something. Precisely. So. Uh, the fact that I can report these values means I can report anything. Right. I could report state of switches, states of relays. I could report temperature, humidity. In other words, if it's a value that I was able to display on my serial console previously, yeah. I can now display it through the Ethernet of Remotely. Interface. Yeah, how I about like that, it. right? Ooh, look at that. It's so fast. All right, you shouldn't play with knobs that okay. much on All right. TV. All right. So this is what we're going to be doing, but we're going to be Bumping it up a notch. Okay. Now, before we go any further, let, let, for those people out there who are wondering how they're going to do this on their own, you do need a little bit of gear. Uh, the first is, of course, you're going to need an Uno, or an Arduino Uno. <laughs> uh, we've got we've got a link here uh, for the one that I prefer. This is the Geekrete Uno R3. This is, is actually this using an Arduino. A, or it's is an, this a... well, it's a clone, but this uh, is using a genuine Atmel chipset. Okay. Which okay. I like because there are some that are really gray market. I don't trust. Well, and I know in the past we've definitely uh, said you could buy a bunch off of eBay if you're yeah. planning on doing a bunch of prototype builds. But if you're doing something like this where the, the balance of your plants hangs yeah. in, in the, the power of the Arduino that you're using, you should probably get one that... That won't die the yeah. first time you use it. <laughs> That's silly like that. Oh, the second thing you're going to need is a, it's a W5100 Ethernet shield. Now, this is the one I'm using. Uh, I got a bunch of these. I actually bought them uh, in bulk for like six bucks a pop. Uh, there is one other option, actually, Alex, if you go to the next one. It's also a W5100, but mm -hmm. it has PoE, so that's what... Uh, <gasps> Power the, over Ethernet? Precisely, and this is, this is actually a genuine Arduino part. Ooh. What this will allow me to do is I can have a single cable, rather than having power and Ethernet, this would get it from the PoE port on the board. And 5 volts? 5 uh, volts? What, right, it takes the 48 volts and it... That's down to five. cool. If yeah. only I had a switch that I had taken without permission yeah, that I did. And if only I still had a switch at my house that Ethernet. I could just plug in and have PoE. And, That's you know. so weird. Yeah. Weird. You're never going to get it back. Uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So what we're going to do now is let's, uh, let's when you say we make the project a little sexier, Brian? Yes, that's the, the main goal of any Arduino project is to make it more sexy. Yeah, because we've been uh, playing with static input, but what I want to do now is uh, I want to go ahead and add a little DHCP into the mix. Whoa, yeah. you sure we can show that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to get to that in just a bit, but first, mm -hmm. these messages. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. Now, you've heard about them if you've watched Know How. You know that they are the kit, the place that Brian and I love the most to find all the knowledge, all the parts, all the tools we need to get the job done right. Now, I, I understand you're a maker, you're a DIYer. That's why you're watching the show. But you must know what it's like to try to use the wrong tool. You know, the, 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 the little Phillips screwdriver that's just a little too small, so you're kind of stripping the screw? Or how about that flat screwdriver that's way too small, and you're just trying to wedge it into a hex nut? It doesn't work really well. What you need is the right tool for the right job, and that's where iFixit can help. Uh, iFixit is the premier provider of repair knowledge, tools, and parts. They've got more than 22,000 free repair guides and 90,000 troubleshooting solutions. The good people at iFixit are experts in consumer electronics repair. They do it. They do their teardowns. They put them on the internet so you see what's inside of your favorite devices. They give you all the repair knowledge that you need for free. Of course, they also sell a wide array of parts and tools to help you get the job done right. They know what they're doing, so they built a toolkit that does too. That's this, the ProTech Toolkit. It's a completely reimagined design. It's just as rugged and portable as before, but even more useful. This kit shows their obsession with detail, from the durable canvas case, from the hand-selected high-quality steel bits, from the custom anodized aluminum driver handle. They've thought of everything so that you only have to worry about the fix. This is going to include their 64-bit driver kit, precision ESD-safe tweezers, including a pair of reverse tweezers, a wide variety of plastic opening tools and picks to safely work on tablets and smartphones without destroying the case as you try to pry them open. They've got a suction cup for display assembly removal, as well as a metal spudger and iFix its own rubber-handed Jimmy pry tool. The ProTech Toolkit is the last precision toolkit that you'll ever need, and that's why it's backed by a lifetime guarantee. Folks, if you want to do it like we do here on the show, if you want to get your DIY and maker nirvana, you owe it to yourself to try iFixit. The people at iFixit never stop repairing, and with this toolkit under your belt, you won't either. Head over to iFixit.com twit and use the code KNOWHOW at checkout to save $5 on your purchase of $10 or more. Even if you don't buy anything, 
you can still use their free repair guides, troubleshooting answer forms, and other educational resources on their site anytime your tech has an accident. That's ifixit.com slash twit. And we thank iFixit for their support of know-how. Okay, Brian, so we've got our Arduino here yes. with a static server that's just sending out the little, uh, little uh, values of our potentiometers. Right. Interesting, and it's a, it's a good foundation, but we yeah. want it to do something a bit more. So what if, what if we were to do this, but this time go with DHCP? Okay, let's okay, do that. Let's do yeah. that. Because this, <laughs> this, this is more akin to something that you would have at home. You plug it in and you wait for it to get an address right. rather than you assigning it an address. Right, right, okay. right. So okay. the code for this is actually pretty simple. Let's go ahead and drop back over here. I'm going to close this one over. And we've got this. So it's basically the same code as before mm -hmm. with a couple of modifications. So again, I'm including two libraries, SPI and Ethernet.h. Yeah. I'm setting the MAC address right here, so that's my physical address. But this is where it's changing. Ethernet client, client, Ethernet server, server 80. Server 80 is the same, right? Server 80 is the same, but this is not. Because right. normally what I did in the previous example was I set an IP address. It was a static IP address of mm -hmm. 198.168.0.229. Oh, yeah. By putting Ethernet client, client, what I'm saying is, go ahead and run through the startup procedures in the library to get a DHCP address. Right. Right. Let your network handle the rest. Precisely. And that, let's, you know, this is going to take a while, so I'm going to go ahead and start uh, uploading it now. Okay. Uh, now, I have one function, one main function, and that is the print IP address. What this is going to do, this is going to, on the serial console, it's going to print the IP address once it has it from the DHCP server. Okay. Before, so then you know. Right. Before it has it, it'll just be blank. But once it has the, the, the address, I'll get it on the serial console. Uh, one quick note here, yeah. just because it shows up on the serial console doesn't mean that the server is ready to serve out pages. It just means it's received the address, address. and now it's starting up the server. That okay. could take another 60 seconds. All right, just All right. Do good it. to in, know. In case you're doing this at home and following along with the video, if, if you're waiting, just wait a little bit longer because if you did the code right, it just might How be much taking. waiting is too long, though? Like five, five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. yeah okay. Five minutes is about the timeout. All right, so uh, that's going to be printing my address. Now, in my setup, again, pretty simple. I'm going to open up my serial console. Uh, I'm, then I'm going to print out, uh, if, if this doesn't get an address, it's going to halt the program because the program's useless. Right. Uh, that's almost never happened. It's only going to happen if you have a pretty bad <laughs> network. OK. Uh, then it's going to start the, uh, the server. Now, here in Serial Alert, this is something that, that I made. Uh, this just tells me whether or not, uh, this gives me a, a case back from the um, uh, from the Ethernet function uh, in case it fails. But oh, it, hopefully okay. you won't have to use it. Right. Okay. Now, in my HTML server, this is going to do the exact same thing that we did before. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to open, it's going to listen. Once it hears from a client, it's going to serve out the page, which is going to include mm -hmm. the value of my two wiper pins. Right. Okay, and actually, that's uh, my refresh is back, set back for five. If you look at my loop, it's only really going to do two things, serial alert and HTML server. So it's okay. going to keep going back and forth, back and forth. So let's go ahead and open up a serial console. Hopefully, my Arduino is up and running. Up and running. Point. Let's see if it's... Uh, Should be. Are you happy? Are you, are you happy, happy Arduino? Arduino? I don't see any little tears coming out oh, of it, so it should be okay. Might be taking a little time. Okay, it's still taking longer. Oh, it's, it's so hot. It is. Oh, wait, <laughs> it's getting there. It's getting there. See, once I start seeing those lights... Those blinky little, lights are blinky. good. Wait, it, it can be. It's got a little bit of activity. It could also mean that it's failing out on trying to get a DHCP address, mm. which unfortunately I think is what just happened. Uh, all right, well, let's try uploading that again. Mm. I did send it to the right port, right? The com? Yeah. The right com? Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, because I'm using a really janky third-party router down here. Um, <laughs> what is, is it the WRT54? No, it's this old D-Link that uh, oh. was obsolete back in 2008. It's, oh, I had it. See it. And, yeah, I know. Uh, one of the other things to remember about this is this is one of the reasons why I like static because uh, if you are using DHCP, because this is such a stripped-down library because it has to fit in an Arduino, yeah. it doesn't handle problems really well. If you have a network issue, right. it just says, okay, I'm done. 
Okay. Uh, well, fortunately, we've covered static IPs pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. well. And so. again, there's a really easy way for us to, to do it. Actually, Alex, if you go back, all I'd have to do is I'd have to, re I'd have to comment out the Ethernet client line, and I'd have to put the, uh, uh, set the IP address, again, for like 192.168.0.229. Mm -hmm. All right. It's... Little, okay, wait, that looks oh, better. Yeah, it's got another little light lit up. Okay, so it could see, be what something. What are you doing? Oh, I'm light. No. Yeah. No, it's still waiting. Oh. Arduino, you can do it. We just got to cheer it on. Come you got on, this, little guy. Arduino. You got this. Come on, you can do it. Come on. Actually, no. I don't think it can. I think, you uh, think the, you're dead, Arduino. I think the DHCP server is just completely crapped out. Psh, we don't need DHCP. Ah. <sighs> This, wait, oh. <laughs> you keep giving me false hope. <laughs> <It's> like, oh, wait. <laughs> okay, so here we have, it's, it's now received its DHCP address. That took an exceptionally long time. 192.168.0.196. Now again, just because it reported the address doesn't mean the server is ready to serve. Let's go ahead and type in that address and see what we get. Uh, so it's 192.168.0.196, and there we go. Okay, so now it's serving again. You can see this. these are the instructions for it to serve. Uh, and these wipers, I can now change the wipers, and it should every five seconds. My though, values. There so. we go. Every five seconds, a very slow refresh. Uh, hopefully, though, you've seen the reason why I like using static. DHCP definitely does work, yeah. but it's a whole lot slower. A whole lot slower, and chances are that that IP address is going to change next time you plug it. And yeah. Plug it back yeah. in. Well, I can actually force it to change. All I'd have to do is go in here and change like this to zero one. And now it has a new MAC address. And now it's a new MAC address. So it's a whole new device. a new device. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yes. And if it has the same MAC address as another device, then you SOL on that. But Precisely. <laughs> okay. Now, this is, this is OK. But you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to take some knowledge that we dropped on them previously. I thought you were going to say sexy again. I, I was like, I don't think it could get sexier than DHCP. Pretty, no, no, no. How about if we added like this? Whoa. OK, so because this, <laughs> now we're talking about something that's in an actual deployment. In my screen, yeah. the, the Arduino, the Groduino that I've created, I don't want to have to connect it to my computer via USB in order to get no. the address. Yeah, that's That's pain. really not useful. Especially if it's just that little amount of data that you want to see. Super small yeah. amount of data, and I have to bring out a laptop. I mean, what's <laughs> going to happen is I'm just not going to end up using like, if right. it. If it breaks, I'll just go, ah, turn it off. Ugh, yeah. What would be better is if I actually put a screen on it so yes. that I could, at a glance, see the IP address so that rather than having to plug in, I could just go onto my laptop and connect. Let's do it. Let's do Come it. On. So uh, just like before, when we're playing with the LCD screen, we need to give it power. So I'm going to use the 5 volts that I'm also giving to the, uh, the wiper here. So this goes to 5 volts, and this goes to ground. There we go, and now I've got a little light up on my screen. And uh, white is my SDA, that's my data, and uh, brown is my clock line. And I know, because I've done this a lot, that SDA is going to be 4, and SCL is going to be 5. Oh, by the way, we had a really good uh, question in our uh, Google Plus group mm -hmm. on why I don't use pull-up resistors. Normally, you would have to use pull-up resistors for these. Yeah. It's because on the SDA and the SCL clock lines on the uh, Revision 3 Atmel chipset, mm -hmm. it has an internal pull-up resistor. Well, of course. I know, naturally. <laughs> naturally. From, from, from. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to make this easier for me by making it so that my IP address is reported on the screen. Cool. Let's do this. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this example, and we're going to bring in example numero. Actually, let's close the COM port too. Number three. So this is doing the same thing. This is doing a DHCP server, just like we did in the last example. However, you may notice I've added a bunch of libraries. Wire.h, which is the way that we talk to our I squared C devices. I'm also adding an include for the library for the liquid crystal I squared uh, C, which is how we access our, uh, our display. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this part, this actually declares the screen so I can use it. Okay, everything else is the same. I still have my physical address set for this. Mm -hmm. I still have uh, the Ethernet client and the Ethernet server uh, uh, started up right there. Yeah. Uh, I'm still printing to the serial port, although I shouldn't need it because this time it should go straight to the, uh, the, the screen. The screen, right. Uh, now let's, let's look at what has changed down in the setup. In the setup, I've just added this, which we saw in the last episode of Arduino 102. Mm -hmm. Turning on the I2C bus, I'm initializing the LCD, and I'm turning on the backlight. If I right. leave any of those out, it doesn't work. I, mean, I guess you could leave the backlight out, right? If you if, wanted to save power. If you, I mean, yeah, but then you have to like 
get a flashlight to see it. So. <laughs> okay, so don't never do mind. Don't Forget do that. that. Okay. Now, if I look at my uh, my loop, I now have a third function here. So I've done serial alert. I've done LCD report, which is what allows me to push information to the screen, and then the HTML server, which is what allows me to serve out pages. Okay. So let's look at the LCD report function because that's what's new. And, and while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and upload this because we've already seen how long it can take for these uh, these changes to, ta to, to take. All right, so let's look at the LCD report. Super simple here. Mm -hmm. This is all that's in the function. I'm going to set the cursor for 00, zero so that's at the very up left corner. Right. And then I'm going to print... IP address. IP address. Then I'm going to uh, set the cursor for one below, one line below. Mm -hmm. And it, what is it? It's four lines uh, vertically and what, like 20, 20. something? It's four by 20. Right? Four by 20, yeah. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm printing each octet. So octet one, octet two, octet three, and octet four. Mm -hmm. So that's like 192.168.0. Whatever. That's four octets. Okay. So all I'm doing is I'm printing IP address, and then below it, I'm printing the address at which the uh, the device has received an Ethernet address. Cool. Now this is not going to display anything until it's actually received the DHCP address from our router, which we already know takes quite a while because right. of the network setup we have here. Can we just static it again? We could static it, but Brian, what's the fun in that? <laughs> uh, you know, time constraint stuff. No, I don't, I don't do time constraints. Oh, okay. All right, well, there we go. let it roll then. Okay, so Andre, excuse me, we have time constraints. Oh, we do have time constraints. The director. The director. Uh-huh. Okay, so uh, Mr. Director, actually, hold on. What do you got back there that you're doing? Uh, this adjusts the contrast of the screen. Oh. That's right here. That screw? That little screw. And actually, unfortunately, I think I might have jiggled it in, in transit. Which is a problem. Don't worry, though, Padre. Sponsor of the show, I fix it. Probably has a screwdriver yeah. that we could use, but all the kits have disappeared we, from the studio. We, we are bad people. We've stolen all the I fix it kits from the studio. <laughs> Give it a second. It's Give gonna it come second. up here. <laughs> oh wait. Oh. Oh. I, oh. oh I no. didn't actually send it to the. Oh, that or that red at the bottom looks bad. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, oh, no. It's bad. Oh no. Oh. Oh. Hold on. Oh. Hold on. Wait for it. Wait for it. Code there we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Now it's gone. Okay. And you can tell that it's initialized because the, because all you the don't blockiness see is gone. Right. But give it time. Okay. Wait, wait. It's got to get a, a DHCP oh, address. Making sure the camera can see it. Uh, hopefully, you're seeing why I, I do have a recalcitrance to use uh, DHCP. I, yes. I'm a big fan of statics. Uh, but the You're other thing about uh, using DHCP is it means I can take this and put it on any network, mm -hmm. and it should work. If I have a static, I'd have to go in and change the static every time I move networks. And you're a big fan of leaving the plastic on everything. <sighs> go ahead and take it off. Whoop. See, that, now it's not new anymore. No, it's still new. Don't worry. <sighs> I'll leave it. <laughs> Why must you do that? Okay, so my address is 192.168.0.196. Now, it's going to take a while. Uh, let's, and actually, let me show you, if you go back to my screen here, Alex, one of the things I like to do is I open a command window. I'm going to ping that address, 192.168.0.196-t. And, okay, once it starts saying it's got a reply, it means that the server is up. Nice. Uh, if it wasn't up, it would just be it would be saying, you know, no response, no response, no oh, response. Okay. But I should now be able to go here, and there we go. Now I'm getting my, uh, my web page and my wipers are active every five seconds or so. There we go. Nice. Ta -da! Okay, so now we've got it working with an I2C device, mm -hmm. which means I now have something that I can move from network to network, and they don't even have to log in. I mean, I'm, I'm using a computer here with a serial console, but I don't have to. I could just look at that address at the top, and it tells me exactly where I need to point a client. Very cool. I like that. And then, yeah, now we don't have to plug in the whole laptop setup. Precisely, precisely. And this is what we want. Remember, we're going to make our device, our Groduino, is going to mm -hmm. be portable. It should be able to go from one place to another. It's going to be ruggedized, so it's not easy to break. <laughs> right. It's, you can't drown it. It should, it should be semi-waterproof. Should, yeah. Should be, should be semi-waterproof. <laughs> uh, but most importantly, someone who doesn't know anything about programming, I should be able to give them my Groduino, and, and they should just be able to look at the screen. And when they, they see it... They should be the, able to interface with it. That yep. should be it. And then right. access, access it remotely. And that's what I'm going for. Very cool. Now, in order for us to move to the next step, what we need to do, because remember, a Groduino is designed to 
do things at certain times. Turn the yes. lights on, turn the lights off, turn the watering on, turn the watering and off. And then send you update reports. Precisely. But if only we had a device we've already played with on Arduino 102 that could keep real time. It's not Alex? No. You just have a physical person watching just, it and then just, sending you text messages so you, when what, things what happen? So what you're saying is you want an Arduino device where Alex just sits there looking disprovingly at you, just like... Mm -hmm. I do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I feel shame. Okay, so what we've got is this. We've added the an RTC, of course, what? the real-time clock, into nice. this. So this is... This has already been 3D printed. Uh, <laughs> I just I was tired of the. Uh, I like it. Yeah, I, I didn't oh, want the, cool. the, the raggedy. I wanted something look no, little, little sexy. Look at that. Cool. Look at it. It's, it's so cute, Brian. I mean, it's either a bomb or a Groduino. Oops. There's only two things this could be. I need to plug you in. All right, so here we go. Plug in. I'm power. gonna show you the code for this. Oh, look, but plastics on this screen too. Yeah, so basically, go, oh, go ahead, take it off. No, no, it's no, take fine. it off. No, take off the plastic. No, it's okay. I want it to be new someday. Be multicultural. <laughs> so I've all I've done is, and we saw we saw this in Arduino 102. I've plugged in an RTC here into the I squared C bus, uh, so that I can now get the time. So it'll be getting me time, and look at that. So I have time what? and the IP address. But what is the lower part? Oh, pages serve. So like for example. If I were going to go to the active address here, let's make sure it's ready. If you switch back to my computer, Alex, ping 192.168.0.198-t. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the server is ready. So if I switch over to 198 here on the browser, okay, it should be there. We go. Oh, so hi. now it's serving out time. Interesting. Now it's it's kind of serving out time because it's, it's on a five it, second refresh it's on i think like a, a one second or two second uh, it, it's not it's not perfect but if you look back <laughs> over to the screen here alex no, it's not if uh there we go so every time a client requests it's going to increase oh. the counter for how many pages it's served out oh wow yeah it's requesting a lot huh well well yeah every second yeah, or so for it to update that clock <laughs> That's cool. Uh, which, by the way, I should tell you is a horrible, horrible way to display the time. Uh, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. This is just for demonstration purposes, right. folks. Well, will this count up to triple digits? Oh, actually, let's look at the code for this. Uh, but before we look at the code, you know what yeah. I want to do, Brian? I don't know. What do you want to do? I want to take a moment for these messages. Previously on Twit. The company wow. is Digivina. I don't know if you remember this. Make your own vinyl record by using all the old plastic bottles I in your house. I love this idea. You could be the first podcast <laughs> on vinyl. On vinyl. Security now. Tavis Ormandy, our favorite security researcher, tweeted shortly after toweling himself off. I had an epiphany in the shower and realized how to get code execution in LastPass. This is apparently very sophisticated, but also it's going to require some re-engineering. The new screensavers. I'm about to hop on Galactic Attack. It's a converted Kong roller coaster that brings a little Samsung Gear VR into the action. Mixed reality experience. Uh, yep, we're in space. Okay. And we're about to die. Ah! Yeah! Ah! Wow, this is, this is really weird. <laughs> Twit. Ah! Technology for your eyes and ear holes. Digivina is an April Fool's gag. I can't leave you hanging like this. There's no such thing. Although, if I were you, I'd make it. And we're back. Okay, so mm -hmm. we've got our Arduino yes. set up with our little screen here. It's, it's showing us time, it's showing us the IP address, and right. it's showing up pages served. Let's look at the code that it took to make this happen. It's actually not all that complicated. So well, we're kind of over. building on the foundation of everything yeah. that we've covered. This is the whole I idea. I see where you're going with this. Every program gets a tiny bit more complicated, but mm -hmm. it incorporates the lessons from the past. Yes. So let's look at the code. So just like last time, we are including the wire and the liquid crystal libraries because we need to be able to access I squared C and the screen. I'm including this. These are my, remember when I did the example in the last episode for the mm -hmm. real time clock, this is what I'm using. These variables are what I'm using to determine whether or not the screen actually has to be rewritten. Ah, uh, yes. Right, because if I, if I don't have to rewrite a number, I don't want to rewrite it because it makes the screen flicker. Right, right, right. So all this does is it holds the last value. If the last value hasn't changed, it doesn't rewrite it. Smart. Okay. Now uh, here, again, I'm adding the library so I can access Ethernet. This is interesting. This is the counter. Now, I'm using a variable we have not yet used on know-how. I'm using an unsigned integer. 
The reason why I'm using an unsigned integer is because a regular int, yeah. uh, we know it's, it's a 16-bit uh, uh, variable. So it's 65,536 possible values. It's actually 535 because you've also got zero there, mm -hmm. correct? Here's the issue. That's 65,535, but half of those are negative and half of those are positive. Okay. I'm not going to use any negative values. I'm not negatively serving uh, pages. Right. So if I use unsigned, I reserve all of it, 65,535 positive. positive values. Okay, that right? makes sense. That's, so that's, that's why I'm using it. And then there's actually another part of that. If, if I go to the, down to the bottom here, uh, this right here is where I increment the counter. So every time this serves out a page, it's going to increase the counter by one. That's what increases the counter on the screen. Right. However, this is, okay, let's, this is a, let, come uh, back to us, Alex. Huh? Because we have a, this oh, is a PSA. Knowledge bomb? Public is service oh. announcement. <laughs> this is a knowledge bomb. This is how over, buffer overflow errors get made. Whenever you don't account for something going beyond a value, yes. that's when you're, you're introducing an exploit into your code. Okay. okay. So, so now so if you go back to my code, Alex, what I've done here is I have an if statement right after the counter. Mm -hmm. If this becomes greater than 65,534, which means the value is 65,535, uh -huh. set it back to zero. The so reason why I do that, itself. precisely, because if this goes to 65,536, what would happen? I'm overflowed. I'm, I'm now allowing the program to write into parts of memory that it shouldn't write, or it just freezes. Okay, okay, so it could... I see. It, it, it would probably freeze because it's it writing into other parts of the program. If I'm lucky, it will freeze. If, if I'm not, not lucky, and especially since I've now connected this to a network, yeah. someone could use this to write code to memory and then execute it. Wow, okay. That's this, the one, no, when we're talking about all these exploits in the wild, this that's is, the most common one. Yeah. Someone didn't check a counter and it overflows and now it's doing something that they didn't expect. Oh, okay, okay. So whenever, I'm, whenever they talk about checking values or checking ranges, this is what they're doing. That little piece of code right there yeah. allows me to make sure that that's never going to go to a value that I did not expect. Do you think something like that happened with your project where it over-fertilized your plants or was that something else? That was something else. That was something else. That was okay. just bad code. <laughs> <laughs> I would I'd like to say that no, that was bad. Code. It wasn't it was a buffer just, overflow. No, it was, okay, it was stupid. It was, <laughs> it was, I'm, I'm a bad person. That's good to know, though. Yeah, okay, it's, cool. a, it's good to know. Okay, so the rest of it is is actually relatively simple. It's the same project that we had before. The only difference is I've added in all of these libraries and all these functions that I had from uh, Arduino, the last episode of Arduino 102, to include all of the uh, the functions I need to read from the real time clock. Okay. Okay. Cool. So and when I do that. What it allows me to do is this. Let's go to my loop. My loop is just LCD screen and HTML server. So it's uh, L, uh, both of those are going to um, call the RTC, get the data from the RTC, and then serve it out through the Ethernet port. Right. Yeah. So and and actually, what was the address again? Uh, it is. You can see what, it, Brian. Yeah, one nine two dot one six eight dot zero dot one nine eight. And there we go. Exactly. Ooh. So that's what it's doing. Boom. Pretty simple, right? No, uh, yeah, simple. But I can see how we can now build on this to make your remote access and have a display where you don't have to have the laptop hooked up. Right. Pretty cool. Now we're going to be taking a break from Arduino 102. We're going to be coming back in Arduino just 103. Getting interesting. I know, I know. But you know, this is how no hard rules. <laughs> you got to take a breather every yeah, once in a while. Next Thursday, we're uh, we're bringing in Patrick Delahanty. Yeah, for some cosplay stuff. It's right? it's starting to be Comic Con season. Yeah. And uh, so we're going to be bringing in the expert to show you how you're going to show up at your next Comic Con without looking like a noob. There's a reason why we left him on the board, right? Yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> so he'll be here to show us some of the secrets of cosplay, and also I'm um, doing an upgrade to the um, the steampunk goggles. Yeah. Because mine got stolen. Stolen? <laughs> stolen. I was at a first competition for robotics, uh -huh. and I put the hat down for like five seconds. They take the whole thing? They took the whole thing. Wow, that's kind of greedy. Not just the goggles, huh? Hmm. <laughs> Aww, it's that's funny that's because, you know, that, that was one of the kind of the I won't call it lame, but one of the easiest projects we've done on Know How, yeah. and that's the one that every time I wear, people go, oh, it's where can I get popular. one of those? Yeah. Well, we'll we're, build it. We're going to make it better now. Boom. So, yeah. yeah. You stole the wrong one. Was it the one that had like smoke that would come out of it? Or is it no, that's, that's the that's That's going to be the new one? I can't show people that version because there is a danger of it setting their head on fire. 
Well, that's like any of the projects that we do. That's a danger. <laughs> if you watch this show, your head might be set on fire. Indeed. Uh, folks, we know that this was a lot of information, and we don't want you to have to try to copy the code from what you saw on the screen. Actually, the code is available right now. It's what? It's back in the Dropbox. I'm sorry. I, had, I have a, a new public link. But we, yeah. we're going to make it easy for you to get. All you have to do is go to our show notes. Brian, where do they find those? Uh, you could go to the show notes, or you could just... To, you know, watch the show and pause the screen every time Padres on the code and copy. <laughs> no, that would be terrible. You keep uh, suggesting that. I keep that is a suggesting horrible that suggestion. Just as like a torture device for people. But uh, no, no, no. You can easily get the code and everything you need at our show notes at twit.tv slash kh. And not just the show notes, but the shows themselves. Crazy, I know. But you can download them and or subscribe. And if you subscribe, you won't miss any of these long-form episodes that we're doing, like with the Arduino or mm -hmm. the networking. Or what was it like the vlogging oh, studio how about that we did this coming Monday where we're doing a Raspberry Pi tour machine? Yeah, yeah, which we totally haven't filmed yet. No, that's in the future. <laughs> it was a good episode, though. <laughs> it was a from good what episode. I think we did. From in what the I will, will have remembered by that time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Also, don't forget that you can find us on our social media group in Google Plus. It's the best place to go because, well, it's a community. Just go to Google Plus, look for know-how. Very short approval process, but once you're in, you get access to almost 11,000 kitas. That's our know-it-alls. These are people who are in every step of the maker DIY journey. So you can find new people who maybe you can help. You can find experts who can help you with a project that you're stuck in or, or, Maybe you just want to ask a question or show a project that we can show off here on Know How. Again, go to Google Plus and look for Know How. That's not the only place, Padre. No. If you want to find out what we're doing outside of Know How or maybe an upcoming project we're doing or just what is our favorite GIF of the week, usually has to do with corgis. You can follow me at cranky underscore hippo on Twitter. And you can find me at twitter.com slash Padre SJ. There is a third member of our crew. He's a... Uh, well, the he's the heart and soul, there. really. We, we <laughs> he's filled with him. so much emotion. That's yeah, why it just pours into the show. His memory has been burned into the back of our, our knowledge holes. Yes. Yes. And he's yes, yes. I'm imagining that, and yes. it's, it's scary. We call him Steve. Is it Steve? It's Steve. I should know. I've yeah. known him since like fifth grade. Excuse me, Padre. It's Alex. No, That's it's what it was. It's, Steve. it's definitely Steve. Good old Alex. But if you want to follow Steve, you can find him at twitter.com slash A-N-E-L-F-3. That's right. Yeah. He's the flow master. He is. Until next time, I am Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how. Grow Duino, your remote access, it. That doesn't work at all, but that's okay. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, it's not just Grodwino. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of things. <laughs>